the 63rd season of the National Hockey League. It was the year the NHL expanded to 21 teams. But this team, the Philadelphia Flyers, dominated the regular season, finishing first and going 35 games undefeated for a modern professional all-sports record. It was the year one of the greatest ever, 52-year-old Gordie Howe would call his last. It was the year 18-year-old Wayne Gretzky would burst into the NHL, winning both the most valuable and most gentlemanly player awards. It was the first year that the Molson Cup would be awarded in five Canadian cities. In Vancouver, goaltender Glenn Hanlon's outstanding play earned him the Molson Cup. In Edmonton, Wayne Gretzky included the Molson Cup among his trophy collection. And Albertan celebrated the conclusion of the 1979-80 season with the addition of a second NHL franchise, the Calgary Flames. In Winnipeg, Boris Lukowicz was the Jets' Molson Cup winner. In Toronto, defenseman Borea Salming captured his fourth Molson Cup. In Montreal, the great Guy Lafleur added a sixth Molson Cup to his credit. And it was the year the Montreal Canadiens would be trying for a fifth consecutive Stanley Cup. All these incredible happenings were part of the 1979-80 campaign. The Wheel of Fortune spun. Bodies collided. And every team plunged wholeheartedly into the chase for the Stanley Cup. It was the year of change. The National Hockey League presents the 1980 Stanley Cup playoffs. Brought to you by Molson who also brings you Hockey Night in Canada. The New York Islanders finished the regular season with a 12-game unbeaten streak, but they were still regarded as underdogs coming into quarterfinal play. Boston's play was rough. All-out attack. But clutch goaltending by Billy Smith inspired the Islanders. They showed disdain for the Bruins' home ice advantage, retiring Boston in five to move into semifinal play for the fifth time in their eight-year history. Hockey fans in Buffalo saw plenty of action when the Chicago Blackhawks invaded the odds. The Hawks played hard-nosed hockey, but Vesna Trophy winners Don Edwards and Bob Sobe continued their winning ways as they held the port against repeated assaults. Attempts by Chicago to rattle the Sabres were fruitless as Buffalo swept the series in four, displaying the poise that had made their season point total second best in the league. In a rematch of last year's quarterfinals, the Philadelphia Flyers had revenge in mind as they squared off against the New York Rangers. John Davidson, last year's hero, played his regularly consistent game. But with Mel Bridgman blanketing veteran great Phil Esposito and rookie Pete Peters sealing off the net, New York's scoring attack was thwarted. In a complete reversal of last year's series, an inspired Flyer team romped to victory four games to one. Meanwhile, in the Montreal-Minnesota quarterfinals, the Bloomington fans were ecstatic at the prospect of dethroning the King. Their young North Stars had sent shockwaves through the NHL by taking the first two at the Forum from the injury play Canadians. But the reigning Stanley Cup champions storm back to crush the North Stars in the next three games, despite the absence of superstar Guy Lafleur. Still, Minnesota coach Glenn Sonmore rallied his team to win game six and force a crucial seventh game at the Forum. Millions watched on television as this surprising North Star team refused to relent. With under two minutes left and the score tied 2-2, Al McAdam fired the shot heard round the hockey world, toppling the Habs' quest for a fifth Stanley Cup and elevating Minnesota into genuine Stanley Cup contenders. They entered the semifinal round with the Flyers. Could youthful enthusiasm again outshine time-tested experience? 
The North Stars continued the drama, shocking the Flyers in a freewheeling 6-5 upset win in Game 1. Steve Payne's two goals gave Minnesota the victory edge, while Olympian Steve Kristoff's seventh and eighth tallies set a Stanley Cup record for the most playoff goals by a rookie. opening game loss had been a jolt to Philadelphia, but the Flyer team is built on hard work, muscle, and pride. In the second confrontation, they return to their game. Minnesota ran headlong into a stone wall of strength and experience. Flyers coach Pat Quinn, alternating goalies, went with veteran Phil Meir between the pipes, and the Flyers shut out Minnesota in game two, allowing little breathing space the rest of the series. Philadelphia's aggressiveness could have hurt them as they took an excessive amount of penalties. But this time, effective penalty killing would pull the plug on the Minnesota power play. The Flyers never cooled off, winning four consecutive games and moving into the finals for the fourth time in seven years. But the scrappy young team from Minnesota served notice that they'd be back in the future. Meanwhile, the fans in Buffalo weren't interested in next year. They believed that this was their year. A 22-game unbeaten streak at the odds made their home ice advantage seem insurmountable. But as this Islander team had shown against Boston, they could win on the road. Three games later, the Sabres were in a state of shock as the Islanders were on the brink of a four-game sweep. In his first year at Buffalo, Scotty Bowman had become the winningest coach ever in cup competition. His courageous team fought their hearts out trying to do what only two teams in playoff history had ever achieved, come back from a three-game deficit. And they nearly did it, winning the next two. But in game six, the Sabre comeback was grounded. With a 5-2 win, the Islanders entered the final round for the first time in their eight-year history. Now the stage was set for the Flyers and Islanders to open their dramatic matchup for hockey's ultimate prize, the Stanley Cup. Philadelphia fans were obviously enthused, and for good reason. Their team had finished the regular season with the best point total in the league, but they would be facing an Islander club that had already pulled off two upsets. Continuing to jockey netminders, Flyer coach Pat Quinn placed Pete Peters in goal, even though Phil Meir was undefeated in five playoff games. The game started. Play hockey! Both teams anxious. Burn Shoot that Burn it. Yet aggressive. Change of defense, eh? Neither team scored through the first half of period one until Mel Bridgman's diving shot and Dennis Potvaz's unexpected assist welcomed the Spectrum audience to the Stanley Cup Finals with a gift goal. The Flyers had taken a 1-0 lead on a weak shot. New York goaltender Billy Smith appeared to have smothered. But Potvaz inadvertently pushed the puck under Smith's body and referee Andy Van Helleman was right there to make the call. After a power play score by Mike Bossy gave the Islanders a one-all tie, Potvaz decided it was time for him to put the puck in the other goal. He took a centering pass from Clark Gillies and skillfully redirected the puck off his skate and onto his stick to give New York a 2-1 to one advantage right in the city of brotherly love. The lead didn't last as the Flyers answered with two goals of their own. But they could not make their 3-2 lead stand up either. With less than four minutes left in regulation time and the Islanders on a power play, Flyer Bill Barber lost his stick, thereby creating a virtual five-on-three. Stefan Pearson slipped into the slot, and for the second time on the night, an Islander defenseman lit up the red light. The contest was tied 3-3. Throughout the year, these two teams had played to a standstill, both winning two games by identical scores. Now it would take sudden death overtime for one to gain the upper hand. 
Play was even until Jimmy Watson clotheslined John Tinelli, who would have been in all alone for an open shot. As in the semis with Minnesota, the Flyers were taking a lot of penalties. Could they afford such liberties against the Islanders? For an incredible third time, a New York defenseman moved into the slot and scored. Again, it was Potva who ended the struggle with the first overtime power play goal ever in the cup finals. Having the man advantage in the overtime period was quite something unusual, and we felt that if we could go and, and press the Flyers, things had developed. What happened was that uh, the puck went into the far corner opposite my point. John Tinelli got a hold of the puck and had full control of it behind the Flyer net. And as I moved in, I yelled at John Tinelli for the pass. He laid a beautiful pass to me, and all I had to do really was hit the net with the puck, and uh, that ended the game and made a lot of people happy, especially myself. It gave the Islanders a playoff record of five overtime wins. The Flyers left the ice having also lost the home ice advantage they had worked so hard to achieve. Only one second had remained on Watson's costly penalty. But this second was time enough for a Stanley Cup first. The next day it was back to practice for the Flyers. Short passes. Do two, two, and one here to start. With both teams so evenly matched, Quinn's new strategy in goaltending would indeed play an even more important role. Yep. Nice and looks for the top corner coming off the wing. Likes to try and put it up in here. Every Adender player was discussed at length, and the mistakes of the previous game were analyzed. Hey, he can really take off. Well, we didn't go to the net at all last night, uh, partially because they did a good job of putting us wide. So Quinn worked on having the Flyers drive to the front of the net. Right up. Too long. Continue on through for the shot. It worked as Paul Holmgren and the rest of the Rat Patrol line heeded their coach's words. The Flyers bore down on the Islanders' defense, driving toward the net and applying the kind of pressure that had been lacking in game one. One man that needed no prodding was Bobby Clark. He was one of a handful of flyers that had sipped from the cup in 74 and 75. Thirsting for more, Clark and his teammates applied a head-on assault on the Avender net. Bob Kelly scored his first goal of these playoffs, and Clark's four playoff points on the night would give him 101, third best among active leaders. Ryan Croce, the Avender scoring leader, finally ended a string of four unanswered Philadelphia tallies, converting a rebound and inching him closer to the all-time single-year Stanley Cup scoring title. But with scrappy Kenny Lindsman barking the signals, the Flyers resumed their onslaught. Lindsman fed Paul Holmgren a perfect pass for his third goal of the contest. It was Holmgren's first hat trick ever and the first time in the cup finals that a United States foreign hockey player had achieved such a feat. With an 8-3 win, Philadelphia had regained their competitive edge and were anxious for the trip to Long Island. With the series knotted at one, play resumed two days later at the Nassau Coliseum for game number three. fans were quite confident. Philadelphia had three power play chances in the first period, but three times Billy Smith frustrated them. The Flyers still had the man advantage when Bob Bourne stole the puck and directed a breakaway pass to Lauren Henning. Henning had only to beat Bill Meir, who was starting his first game of the finals. A hard slap shot deflected off Meir's pass. This was the Auditor's seventh shorthanded goal in the playoffs, beating the Rangers' year-old record of six. The goal had to be a great psychological lift, especially after the drubbing they had sustained in Philadelphia. Furthermore, New York's physical play was taking its toll on the Flyers as Paul Holmgren and blue liner Jimmy Watson both went down with injury. The Auditors put their feared power play back into swing. They 
were on the verge of blowing this game apart, and forward Mike Bossy said they owed it to their incredible power play. The power play worked the way it worked in the first game. We weren't getting that many shots, but the shots that we were getting were right on target. You know, we don't have a power play where we have one set play. No, and they showed the Flyers the difference, exploding for five consecutive power play goals as the Flyers fell 6-2 to two in the game and 2-1 to one in the series. Still, Islander coach Al Arbor remained cautious. The both clubs are a little similar. They're good skating clubs and a lot of offensive strength. When they're on their game like they were the other night, and we were on our game like we were tonight, anything can happen. There also was an air of unpredictability to the Stanley Cup luncheon as the gathering waited to hear the selection for Coach of the Year. In his first full year, Pat Quinn won the very award Al Arbor received last year. Being from outside the organization, and I believe you could ask players throughout the league, if there was one organization that typified the word team, uh, they'd probably say the Flyers. This first place team didn't rely on any one man. Not one of them was amongst the 25 leading scorers. Such was their balance. However, the Islanders had finished as the NHL's hottest club, and in this series, their architect, general manager Bill Torrey, thought early leads a main reason for blowouts the two previous games. Last night, we got a shorthanded goal, which really picked us up, and then our power play started to work. So uh, I think in any playoff game, emotion is a very, very important factor. Emotions remained high for game four with everyone participating. <laughs> then with the auditors having the mad advantage, flyer defenseman Mike Busnick succumbed to New York's four checking. Clark Gilly stole the puck and sent it across to Mike Bossy for an easy goal. After the team's traded scores, New York put on the pressure. Fiery Gary Howitt raced up the ice. Ted Brian Crutche, and according to Islander winger Bob Nystrom, changed the course of the game. That turned us right around, it really did. It was a good second effort going down the wing by him, and he set up Trotsch. It was just a big turning point. It's been said before that Gary comes up with the big plays, and he goes out there, and he's a spark plug for it, and tonight he certainly was. At that point, trailing 3-1, to one, the Flyers could have rolled over and played dead. But instead, they garnered all their pride, all their talent, slipping a cross-ice pass between two Islanders for a breakaway. Kenny Lindsman's goal drew the Flyers to within one and upset the Islander crowd. Just when it seemed the Islanders were ready to fall, they calmly cooled themselves down and went to work. First Nystrom scored. Then Clark Gillies, on his way to a three-point game, broke up the wing and iced the contest. New York had earned a hard-fought 5-2 triumph for a 3-1 lead in the series. Only Toronto in the 1942 finals had come back from a deficit this great. But Brian Crutche knew the lure of the cup often brought out the best in a team. This was by far the hardest game we've played against the Flyers. Uh, let people say there was no emotion out there tonight. I'm drained. And I'm sure they are too because they played a hell of a game. In this Philadelphia arena, they had been called the Broad Street Bullies. But for game five, intimidation would matter little. The Flyers had an uphill climb, but their fans never gave up hope. Flyers in seven, man. They're going to take it all. Because it's destiny. Why? Because we're the best. It could kill them. Of course, us. Flyers. It's not all over. you got to have faith in your team. It's my team, and they're going to win. Philadelphia had their backs to the wall, and the Spectrum crowd gave them a rousing standing ovation, especially after learning that Holmgren and Watson would again see action. In their eight-year history, the Islanders had been unable to win the big one. All right, gents, good luck to both of you. Let's go. Tonight would test the fortitude of the two best teams in hockey. Officiating hockey is the toughest of all sports, both mentally and physically. But referee Wally Harris keeps the contest under control with a firm hand. Yes! Two! Eddie, you got the stick up. You got him with a high stick in. That's all I want. In. No, stay out of there. Stay out of there. All right, Wally. Whether you want to use a stupid penalty, I'm telling you now, calm down. It's a stupid 
penalty. I keep out of there. I know, yeah, but I don't blame you. The only trouble is, Smitty, you broke the stick on him, and that's the fight. Both of you guys have taken a pushing before. We don't need that stuff. The Flyers had come out snarling, but fell behind when Stefan Kurson opened the scoring by beating Peters to the glove side. The chance of a third Stanley Cup was rapidly slipping from their grasp. But the Flyers gritted their teeth and dug down deep. And after Clark tied it, Rick McLeish sent them ahead 2-1. to one. It was part emotion that was carrying them, but more, the sensational goaltending of Pete Peters, who would make 35 saves, some bordering on the impossible. Great save, great save, great save. Great save. The Flyers and their loyal followers again were feeling good. When the police scored a second goal of the night, the Flyers were well on their way to 60 minutes of superb hockey. Finally, Holmgren took a perfect behind-the-back drop pass from Linsman and snapped it home. His 10th goal of the playoffs sealed a decisive 6-3 victory and kept the Flyers' hopes of a third cup alive. Well, we were ready. We had to, we had to win tonight. We got to win Saturday night. It's all there is. The pressure, I guess, someone has to be on them because they, you know, they've got to be thinking they've got to win on the island there because if they don't, then they're going to be in trouble coming back here. Played very soundly, and uh, with this win tonight, we hope we have tightened their cheeks up a little bit. New York returned home, leading three games to two. The Flyers were riding an emotional crest. Could the Islanders turn the tide again? Philadelphia scored the game opener, but then the Auditors tied it up on a controversial play. Netminder Pete Peters stopped a Mike Bossy shot. On the ensuing rebound, Dennis Potbab brought a stick high in the air, but made contact with the puck below his shoulder for a valid goal. The Auditors established a new postseason record with 14 power play goals, while Brian Frache's assist gave him the all-time single-year playoff scoring title. With the game tied 1-1, Clark Gillies dropped a pass behind the blue line to Butch Goring, but the official missed the offside call, allowing play to continue. Seconds later, Wayne Sutter gave the Islanders the lead. To Islander fans, it was a goal, and that was all that mattered. With his knee braced and heavily taped, Paul Holmgren fought through three Islanders to help give the Flyers renewed life, passing to Brian Kropp, who tied the game. Now 2-2, it was a brand new hockey game, but it didn't stay that way for long. New York took the play to the Flyers in the second period, out shooting Philadelphia 12-6 with all-out hustle. Come on, boys! Let's go, you Islanders! Do it, Jack! Their effort culminated with two goals, one by Nystrom, and this one from Mike Bossy. Down four to two going into the third, Bobby Clark and the Flyers refused to quit. They fashioned a furious rally, started by a long Bob Daly slap shot. And capped five minutes later on a deflected blast that bounced off John Paddock's skate right into the net. From a two-goal deficit, the Flyers have come back to tie the game for a second time. Fourteen more minutes of frantic hockey follow. Each team trying to get the better of the other. But these two tired teams would face sudden death overtime. Now, one shot, one mistake, could win or lose it all. The stage is set. Brokes are dry. Who will be the hero? From now on, it's do or die. Both coaches brace themselves for what could be agony or ecstasy. 
The pounding pressure continued through seven minutes of extra play. Each team trying to unnerve the other until... Islanders number 10, Hennett. To Tonelli. Here's Tonelli with Nystrom. The pass to Nystrom. After fighting off a choke label for the past four years, the Islanders finally had hockey's ultimate prize. One swift motion had ended 40 years of Stanley Cup drought in the state of New York. There was the joy of the winners. The veteran hero consoling the dejected rookie goalie. But most of all, there was the cup. It is like no other feeling in professional sports. All these players grow up, dreaming someday of skating around the rink with a Stanley Cup hoisted high in victory. And this was a team that had had many memorable contributions from all. I'm glad it's over! Billy Smith had been there since the beginning. All right! Unsung hero John Tinelli. We won the Stanley Cup this year as a team, and that's with a capital T. Mike Bossy had scored more than 50 goals for the third straight year. Bob Nystrom was the man in the clutch. Clark Gillies ruled the corners. Rookie Ken Morrow had won Olympic gold in the Cup all in three months. Dennis Potva was their leader and Butch Goring their added touch. Thanks, guys! Thank you, one and all, boys! And Brian Trotche was awarded the Conn Smythe Trophy as the playoffs' most valuable performer. But the word team had spelled their success. With it came the taste of champagne for the 1980 Stanley Cup champions, the New York Islanders.